there? You checked? Uh, I haven't checked the sound yet. Oh, okay. You can do that now. Is it coming through? Is it coming through? Is it coming through? Is it coming through? Warren? Warren? Uh, the name is called Warren. Yeah, no, it's only a Oh yeah, probably was. Oh, I was the Smile, I couldn't resist. <laughs> so this is a birthday party, right? That's great. Did you take one of the meetings? I did. not No, no, I'm waiting. Greg, you look marvelous. Thank you. see you. Yeah. Wow. 
Columbus Center in New York City, Montreal's Museum of Fine Arts, the Ottawa City Hall, the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa, and Vancouver, Vancouver Library Square in British Columbia, Canada. The partial listing mentioned reflects the philosophical basis of a search for joy and serenity in the form, in the form spaces of our presenter and concurrently shares these values with the man we want to hear tonight, Archangelo Castier. A summary of his thoughts on architecture were contained in his book, Form and Purpose. They reflect his values and why we are gathered here tonight. And I have to share them as they seem so fitting, and I quote, He who seeks truth shall find beauty. He who seeks beauty shall find vanity. He who seeks war shall find gratification. He who seeks gratification shall be disappointed. He who considers himself a servant of his fellow human beings shall find the joy of self-expression. He who seeks self-expression shall fall into the pit of arrogance. Arrogance is incompatible with nature. Through nature, the nature of the universe, and the nature of man, we shall seek truth. And if we seek truth, we shall find beauty. Speaking on language and ethics and architecture, it is my pleasure to introduce Moshe Sassi. It's a pleasure to be at the BAC. Happy birthday, Jean Cassier. It's an honor to be speaking in a lecture that honors you. I have chosen to speak about ethics and morality in architecture, somewhat growing out of a letter I received from Michael Sorkin a few months ago. This was leading towards the AIA convention. And Michael was heading a panel at the AIA convention, which he had titled The Star System, Ethics and Morality in Architecture. Some of the stars refused to come. But Michael sent a letter in which he listed 25 questions which he thought those participating might consider. And I'll read some of them, not all of them. He asked, should an architect design a building which deprives another building of daylight? <laughs> should an architect build a building which he or she believes to be too big for its site? Should an architect participate in a project which is strongly opposed by a community in which it is to be built? Should an architect design a building which has a use which he or she believes to be incompatible with its intended context? Should an architect design for a government, such as, dot, dot, I won't read all the names, which practice a form of discrimination or oppression which would not be tolerated here, here meaning in the United States? Should an architect sub substantially modify his or her own expressive preferences to accommodate those of a client or community. And further down, should an architect devote an entire career to the design of the institutions and um, inhabitations of the rich? If not, what is an adequate type to those unserved by architecture? And uh, finally, in an era of looming global ecological catas catastrophe, should an architect collaborate in the depletion of any non-renewable resources or the subtraction of any green space from the planetary inventory? And so it goes. Um, I think it's a good start to sort of relate to some of these questions. Um, and in some ways, given the manner in which architecture has been embraced by the other arts, I think the question is complex and, and particularly time timely. Because the question as to is there an ethical framework uh, for the, within the other arts for the work of a painter or sculptor <coughs> or, or, or a work of music it has been the subject of enormous discussion. And generally, architecture has been differentiated from this discussion. And in many ways, as often it is with Philip Johnson, who seems to, to sort of clinch the spirit of the time, uh, I think when he said, and this was in 1980, uh, there are no rights, no wrongs in any of the arts or architecture today. Only the world of wonderful freedom. 
uh, that Johnson was really summing up what is really the uh, dominant attitude towards the question of ethics and morality in architecture. That you cannot judge the work of an artist and you cannot judge the work of an architect. Therefore, we cannot assess these things in any objective way, nor can we have conversations about them. Because, well, we have conversations about them, but we can't agree about right or wrong. Now, what is the reality? The reality, relating back to Michael Sorkin's questions, is that a major chunk of these issues are taken care of us by building codes and safety codes. And so when it comes to sort of, will a building collapse or not, or will you uh, survive the fire in it, uh, we don't even make judgments. The judgment is sort of made for us. Uh, but at the same time, it is fair to say that codes generally shy away from any judgment or, or prescription of issues that have to do with the quality of the environment, of environmental quality. Safety can be mentioned, but the quality of the environment uh, is, is one which codes uh, attempt to stay away from. Now, on the other hand, some architects have attempted to develop codes of one kind or another which are qualitative in their nature. I think particularly the work of Christopher Alexander in his pattern language uh, and his other writings attempts to try and uh, uh, distill uh, what are the elements in a design, uh, what are the patterns which we, might, which we might repeat and perpetuate because they lead to certain qualitative uh, certainties. Some years ago, together with uh, Dean Jose Luis Sir and Adair Ardalan and Doshi and Candilis, we got together and wrote uh, what we call them the Habitat Bill of Rights. Uh, and our effort there was to see whether you could look at the community and put down on paper a prescription of those qualities which must be respected. And if we delve into qualitative questions, it is easy, easy to see uh, what enormous impact they could have if one took them seriously. For example, if you said any dwelling should have a garden, whether it's an apartment or a house, uh, what does that mean in terms of design? Then I'll come back to that. Or if you said any person <coughs> should, be, should have daylight in a workspace, are all, all the building types, that most of the building types which we, which we take for granted today would be out of the window. And that is the elements that generate an architectural design. What are the forces, what are the considerations that go through the mind of an architect when a design is generated? Now without question, a design is generated through a complex process of conscious and subconscious considerations. Uh, if, we, if, each, if any of us had to define how that process goes on in our own mind, we would have a hard time uh, doing it. But it's fair to say that though part conscious and part subconscious, the design process is a combination of personal and collective considerations. By personal, I mean things which are unique to the individual who's designing. And by collective, I mean elements in the design which the individual receives from the culture, receives from society. Uh, the personal is unique. Is, it is that that makes the work of one architect different to the work of another architect. And the collective becomes part of the process through a number of, of elements. For example, simply inherited understanding of, of architectural solutions. Uh, in a sense of evolution, in the sense that we, we, we are part of a whole evolution of a building process which is part of our understanding and thinking. There is, of course, the history of building, and there is also what we are expected to do in terms of society expecting us to do, also part of this inventory of, of solutions which precedes us. And there is this balance between the collective and the personal. Uh, I say that there's a balance, and maybe it's a, a more appropriate to say that there is a tension. Uh, and, uh, if we are to look back at, at the history of architecture, you could say that in this tension between the personal and the collective, the collective always dominated. That which we received from society or from our culture was much more dominant in the de design process than that which was unique and personal to us as a, as a designer. And the reasons for that were, were numerous. For one thing is, one built into an urban context and one 
always respected the need for the urban continuity, so that that in itself was one of maybe the greatest constraints that the designer faced. But there were also natural constraints which had to do with the craft of building, the technology of building, the, the sort of prevalence of building types which were part of an inventory in the culture. Um, and in that sense, the latitude which a designer had uh, were relatively, uh, relatively uh, small. And I think today you could say that the sort of process has gone to the opposite extreme. That the person today uh, is, is quite uh, substantive in that process. That the uh, existence of constraints is much more, uh, 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 is, is, is reduced. Not so much in the sense of economic constraints, perhaps these have even become greater, but in terms of the range of uh, possible technologies of building, range of materials, and in a sense, uh, the sort of uh, ambiguity about whether uh, urban fit is a meaningful objective today. And in fact, if, to go back to Philip Johnson, if he's correct by saying that there are no rights, no wrongs, that anything is possible, that there is a world of wonderful freedom. It is, in a sense, if we accept that statement, the end of urbanism as we knew it. Because without the conviction of the necessity of each building, each building act being part of a collective act of community, then what is there? And perhaps there is a hint here at the new kind of urbanism, one that we haven't known in the past, but that we should we will come back to. Well, I think that we must come back, though, and, and relate architecture to the other arts. Is it reasonable to assign to architecture the same standards of consideration than we would for other arts? And the, it, it used to be said, a term that I remember as a student sort of always being suspicious of, is that architecture is a social art. And in that sense, it, 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 it is different from, say, the fine arts uh, or from literature. But I would like to state it somewhat differently, even though it might say the same thing, and say that the reason I think architecture is fundamentally different to the other arts is that architecture affects the lives of millions of people directly and non-voluntarily. In other words, it's not a matter of choice. Architecture affects the lives of people in a non-voluntary way and hence my own ethical position about architecture, and hence my deep disagreement, if it hasn't been made clear yet, with Philip Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'd like to do, uh, before getting into uh, uh, looking at, at how I have attempted to deal with this in a variety of projects over the years, I'd like to focus on what I feel are three aspects relevant to our discussion uh, in relationship to the generating, uh, generating of a design, uh, the elements that inform architecture. And the first, which to me is central, and perhaps and certainly the most important, is our sense of response as, as designers to the intended use of the building. Uh, all kinds of words come to mind, the idea of program, a program that states the intended use of a building. But not to get too specific uh, or too constraining, I'd like to actually look to morphology for the kind of uh, interpretation of what that means. Darcy Thompson, who uh, began the science of morphology, said when he was speaking about morphology that it has to do with forms, which are the study of forms, which are so concomitant with life that they are seemingly controlled by life. And it seems to me this is an apt description of what the design process is all about. It is the necessity of understanding the life with the life intended in a building and finding the appropriate way to, to, to accommodate that as the design evolves. Another way of putting it is it is the question as to whether we are able as designers to completely identify with the user of a building for whom we are making a design. Can we become them? Can we in our mindset start thinking as if we were them? To what extent as we design do we become them and are able to consider the, 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 the questions 
that we face as designers in their shoes. And of course, I could take all kinds of examples. I could take this example of a school, uh, of housing, uh, of workspace, and, uh, and, and consider what some of these issues would be. And in some ways, again, I think, in taking any of these examples, take the example of a school, uh, we recognize some of the tensions that we experience as architects. Because if you take a school, for one thing, uh, well, who's the user? Is it the school board or is it the students and the teachers? And, and, and whose concerns do you identify with? Uh, the, the bureaucracy who sets uh, the rules for the school or those who will actually be in it? And of course, on the question of the whole uh, method of education which a building accommodates, there isn't a single answer. So to what extent do we as architects become part of that dialogue as to the education process in a building? But at the same time, I think one with humility must remember that we, if, we, if we are entrusted with the design of the school, uh, and we might have all kinds of agendas on our mind of things that interest us as a designer. A generation later, people experiencing and using that building would forget and not have any interest in what that agenda was, other than is it a wonderful place for learning. At the same time, I think that uh, what, what we find ourselves is that on one hand, we ask ourselves, who, who, who is the constituency in each case, in each kind of building type? And at the same time, what generates our own scheme? Yes. Are, are projected uh, as we design a building. Uh, we know what we feel, uh, and in that sense, we transfer it to others. And, and so as we look at the work of one architect or another, it is, it is really an appreciation of those values uh, that, that come through. Um, and are, as I said, unique. Now, the second uh, theme that I'd like to talk about is more complex, complex in terms of, its, uh, of, it, of the simplicity in which it fits into uh, an ethical uh, uh, framework uh, in design. And that has to do with the materiality of architecture. Uh, with building being the medium of architecture, uh, it is three-dimensional space built with real materials. Architecture is not models, it's not drawings, though I love both. It's not even now videos and uh, computer uh, projections. It is the lived-in built environment. Uh, this sounds so simplistic that uh, you say, why even say it? Uh, and how and in what way might it even relate uh, to ethical questions in architecture? And I don't have a clear answer there, other than some intuitions. I do feel that when we recognize architecture to be, uh, that the language of architecture is dependent on the, on the materiality of architecture, that it is in fact a manifestation and expression of the materiality of architecture, we are dealing with the authenticity of architecture. We are dealing with what differentiates authentic, the authentic from the stage set. And in sort of some vague way, I would say, why do we feel different in a Gothic cathedral than we do in Disneyland? Uh, some of us actually might not feel that different. <laughs> and in many ways, this is the success, uh, the success of Disney. But in fact, uh, to the extent that we are haunted by the difference, it has to do, I think, with authenticity. So the materiality of architecture brings us closer to that authenticity. I think it has something to do with a very basic fundamental pleasure, and I suppose pleasure is not a fashionable word these days, but nevertheless, let's say pleasure, that we derive when we experience a building, a building and understand how it comes together, understand the sense of its making. And I think that gives us a pleasure, much greater pleasure than when we are in a building where we are confused by the process of its making. And so in that sense, these four concrete beams up here are more pleasing than a suspended, uh, laden acoustic tile ceiling because it gives us a sense of the making of a space, whereas there is a way of, of course, refusing it. Now, this notion of the materiality of 
of architecture is, is certainly not new and, and, and is probably the dominant theme uh, through almost any period. Wright writes about the nature of material. And Kahn wrote about what the brick wants to be. And, and Perret, with humor, when asked what makes a great building, Auguste Perret, he said, a great building is one that makes a beautiful ruin. <laughs> and, and, and yet, I think uh, the simplicity with which one might embrace this and say, this is an essential element of architecture, is somewhat disconcerting. For example, we are aware uh, of the endless discussion and argument about ornament in architecture. And we have a scholar, uh, uh, such as Gombridge, telling us that the desire for ornament is fundamental to the human species. It begins somewhere in the steppes, in prehistoric times, uh, where uh, we decorated uh, our bodies and uh, decorating, uh, decorated our meager structures, and it comes right through to culture today. And then we have Lo saying ornament is a crime. And for decades, this being presented as an ethical framework. And I suppose I would say today, if I had an ethic about it, I'd say, I'm all for ornament as, as long as it's made by machine. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the meaningful ornament made by machine? That's, that's another lecture. <laughs> it also seems that the real breaks, the real moments of revolution in architecture were accompanied by a, a technological change. That, that as you view the history of architecture, there are of course stylistic fluctuations of a variety of kinds, but the ones that we seem to think are, are most significant seem to be related also to a, to a technological breakthrough. And finally, the third aspect is the issue of place or urban fit, which I already referred to. Now, to start with, it goes without saying that the success of a design is, has to do with the ability of the designer to understand the, the genius loci, the, the special character of a place. But I, I go beyond that, and I say, uh, when we design, whether it's in the urban environment or not in the urban environment, uh, a, a, a building which is set in the context of buildings which existed before us, we reveal our sense towards community. We reveal our sense towards commonplace. By commonplace I mean that which is common to all of us. And in each act, uh, uh, if we recognize each act of building that we're involved in to be one of a series of acts we are of, of building, uh, then we understand that that act is one act of many in creating communal space. And here we are really into values and fundamental values. The attitude of, of Levaux in building a, a wing of the Louvre uh, in the sequence of wings that made up the Louvre is fundamentally different to Le Corbusier's attitude when uh, he designed the Carpenter Center at Harvard. And the attitude of uh, Leon Prier in sort of rendering a, uh, a, a gentle uh, uh, neoclassical village on a hill town is again fundamentally different to what uh, uh, the attitude of Le Corbusier was when he delineated the Ville Radieuse. Um, these are questions to do with assonance and dissonance. They have to do with uh, questions of affection and subversion. And I'll come back to the issue of subversion because it seems to me that understanding subversion in architecture is in itself a fundamental question of the ethics of the profession. But one way or the other, it seems to me that the appreciation of the principle that the sum total is greater than the parts, and that is a sine qua non of urbanism is, is, is fundamental uh, to the belief that communal space or, or community space or ur urbanism are possible. If I could have the slides, please. I'm going to take you through a series of projects uh, which touch on the various themes I spoke about and, and drawing about issues as I face them uh, in during, uh, during the years that, that I've had the opportunity to build. And I go back to uh, sort of a comparison which triggered a lot of, uh, triggered a lot of uh, what went on in my own mind when I was designing Habitat, which was a comparison between two housing uh, projects, you could call them, or two places of habitation in Jerusalem, 
uh, the vernacular village uh, sitting on the sitting on the hillside of individual units and this 1950s public housing project also sitting on the hillside relatively similar density and obviously totally different sensibilities uh, in terms of a bureaucracy interpreting a program of housing and self self-built self-designed housing interpreting maybe the same program and uh, again in the 60s as we traveled as a group of students looking at housing in North America, this sort of tension, maybe I place it here as a caricature, but nevertheless a tension between one interpretation of a program and another interpretation of the program of housing. And if uh, I was to sort of sum up habitat uh, uh, in, in, a, in very few words, I would say it had to do with the notion that this tension between the village and the high-rise apartment could be diffused by inventing a new building type. Uh, that by creating houses and gardens and uh, villages in a high-rise environment, one could actually diffuse that tension and create the kind of life, quality of life, even though one was dealing with a dense high-rise building, uh, this program. And in Frobisher Bay, in the uh, Arctic Circle, Canadian Arctic Circle, uh, in with housing, these are the settlements that the nomad Inuits were moved into by the government of Canada in the 50s and the 60s. And in the 70s, we were called in actually by the Inuits themselves to try and design something better than what was then nicknamed the matchboxes. They also would burn like matchboxes. And we devised at the time a whole system of building with plywood, stress skin plywood, which could be shipped. Uh, in small containers and assembled uh, without equipment and there was uh, in the long night the igloo recreated in fiberglass and wood. Um, I'd like to move on to the same issues of program in the high-rise dense environment. Um, the issues of again what generates the design uh, and these slides I took out of my uh, file from a quiz that I once had, uh, in which I took a whole series of very well-known high-rise office buildings and chopped the tops and the bottoms off, uh, looking just at the bodies. Uh, and most participants had difficulty identifying them. Uh, and then, of course, showing the tops and the bottoms, and it all became clear. Uh, and the reason, I think, uh, this kind of as I could call it, circumcision, makes the, <laughs> makes the uh, buildings so anonymous is that in fact it reveals something fundamental about the attitude uh, towards the program of the workspace in tall buildings. And that is that as architects, we tend to uh, not dare to intervene with a basic program. We don't, we don't dare question, for example, if we're told each floor must have 37 and a half thousand square feet, each floor should be identical, uh, that, that means that 80% of the people in the building will not have access to daylight. We don't dare say, well, is that a reasonable program? We find it almost out of our depth to say that. And so, by and large, we accept that program, and then the work of architecture becomes one of dealing with what is left of that issue. And I don't think it's a simple problem, and I don't want to to sort of understate the complexity of the tension between the forces of economy and the prevailing building pattern and what architects can, what latitude architects have in it. But I do want to emphasize the notion that if we go back to the, to the uh, uh, fundamental programmatic questions of tall buildings, be they residential or workspaces or whatever, that that immediately sets a different uh, generative mode of evolving a scheme. And this is the, uh, I suppose I could call it notorious uh, Columbus Circle. Uh, the montage is so good that sometimes when I show it, people think it was built and they had me to New York lately. Uh, but as some of you know, it was not built. But here was a project of 3 million square feet. I used to emphasize that I didn't think it was a building, it was sort of a macrocosm of a city. It had uh, 40 floors of apartments, a hotel, the headquarters of major corporation with offices, 
major shops and, and entertainment uh, areas. And the, the issues that uh, concerned me in developing that scheme were uh, the structural framework, the articulation of the different uses in a building, the notion that uh, office space could have gardens in the air, so each five floors could sort of share a great greenhouse, uh, the notion that housing would be like a hilltop, uh, although I must confess not low income hill housing hilltop, <laughs> that these considerations start creating scale uh, devices and breaking up the scale and expressing the various activities within the building and that starts giving the building its richness, including the way in which it comes down to the street, reinforces the geometry <coughs> of the public space and in its in own internal activities rather than siphon off the life off the street really reinforces that and becomes part of the city. I'd like to move on to the, to the notion of, of place of research and, and uh, for science and of course for any kind of, of research and again go to the different attitudes towards program that one could see uh, in different schools of thought. And we have here uh, on the right, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the Salk Institute of Louis Kahn. Uh, and on the left, the Biocenter uh, research uh, in, in Frankfurt of, of uh, Peter Eisenman. And I think it's quite fascinating for me to reflect uh, on what was on Kahn's mind when he worked on the Salk Institute. And I had the privilege to, uh, to have been at the office at the time, in Kahn's office at the time. And Kahn was obsessed with the question of what makes for a space that conducive to creative endeavor. What is this balancing between contemplation, which is private, and collaboration with others, which is a sort of common activity, which then manifested itself in the diagram of the building, of the labs, and the studies, and uh, the whole notion of uh, individual activity and, and collective activity. And Peter Eisenman, when he speaks about this center and many other projects, has a, a, a fascinating agenda of very, a variety of interests. Uh, he, he here speaks about uh, the mathematics of fractals. Uh, he speaks of various texts in philosophy. Uh, and these, one way or the other, somehow generate uh, his uh, geometric explorations. But I think by his own admission, there would be much less uh, obsession, uh, as Kant did, with the notion of the actual life within the place. Or if it is, it's certainly not articulated, as Kahn, as Kahn felt compelled to articulate. Um, recently, we were asked to work on the campus for the super collider, the superconducting super collider in Texas. Uh, may it rest in peace. Uh, <laughs> there will be a few success stories later. <laughs> And where do we start? We start with the prairies. South of Dallas, there is Dallas. This is the Super Collider Tunnel, 17 miles of it already constructed. You see here the 54 mile tunnel with the experiments at one end and experiments at this end. And after a long story that I won't uh, get into, the decision that there would be a central campus that would draw the 3,000 scientists, engineers, and other specialists who are part of this experiment into an interactive place. And the first issue becomes, how do you in this undifferentiated, endless prairie create a sense of place? Uh, luckily, the super collider needed many, cool, many cooling ponds uh, so that the, uh, the uh, magnet could be kept at uh, uh, almost absolute zero. And these cooling ponds, of course, were paid by science because they needed cooling ponds. So, here is one of these cooling ponds. We had dammed the stream. Uh, this is one of about 50 cooling ponds, which becomes the heart of the campus. Uh, the campus then becomes a clustering of labs and studies and offices on one hand, living accommodations, uh, a education center, and spanning across the pond, the cooling pond, is the hub, the center, the downtown, call it what it is. It is the it is the element designed to get 3,000 people who tend not to speak to each other, who have no opportunity to speak to each other, who are too busy to speak to each other, notwithstanding internet, uh, email, 
etc., to maybe meet and talk. Uh, and this really became the interpretation, the central interpretation of the program. And so we see here the uh, offices and labs, uh, and this stretching across the water is that street, with the public arriving from one end, the scientist entrance at the other, and everything gets mixed up here. In some ways, I, I call that the super collider of people. <laughs> And so here crosses the street, uh, auditoria, control rooms, cafeterias, meeting rooms, terraces, stepping into the water. Uh, again, there it is, the library, the auditorium, the control rooms, uh, all plugged along that street. Uh, the control rooms, the public can come from above, look at what's going on below. And these elements forming dam-like elements in the stream with, a, with the water flowing through in, in the uh, southward, southward direction. So that all this interlinks as street-like, in a sense a village or a town, with the, the center and the series of paths and then the ability to expand and extend it uh, as the experiment would thrive which I guess we'll wait for the next generation. Uh, labs, big labs for large installations with smaller labs. And then, inspired, I think, by the notion of the private space in the Sok Institute, at the edge, along the water, in a maybe what is really a fractal kind of geometry, trying to maximize exposure, the private spaces uh, of, uh, of, of work. I'd like to give one more example in the, on the theme of programs, because I'd like to give an example where one interprets a program quite contrary to the way in wh which one receives it. This is a, uh, the design submission for the competition, invited competition for the Museum of Contemporary Art in, in Stuttgart, the model of which is downstairs. And the program read as museum programs read, so many galleries for permanent collection and so many uh, galleries for changing collections, except the emphasis was totally on contemporary art, and the emphasis was not only on contemporary art, but art not yet created. And this sort of became a slogan for me, what does it mean to create a museum, the, the, the bulk of which is to accommodate art not yet created, <coughs> with the program talking about flexible space, and you sort of go through the you, you know the mindset, flexible space means a warehouse, uh, which you can move partitions in. And so I, I felt, well, one must go further, and I was looking at the work of artists who today are not satisfied to sort of work within the, the constrained medium uh, of a painting or a sculpture, but to create whole installations. And, uh, you know, Stella's designing his own museum. Uh, and so the notion was, well, let's accept the fact that there is a fixed set of galleries uh, that form that museum. But that whole sector of the museum, which is made for art not yet created, is truly for art not yet created. So that the tower becomes uh, a crane, a permanent crane, which becomes a symbol of, its, uh, of, its, of, the, of the constant changeability of the building. And on this grid of supports, they can be different installations, different galleries. Uh, uh, there's a translucent egg, there's a, a top-lit gallery, and uh, then the crane removes these, and there is a new installation which can be designed by an architect, by the artist, by the curator. Uh, this is ever-changing. If I can go back, I'm going to try that for a moment. No. Well, in the other photograph, which I... Thank you. There was sort of a, there was another uh, agenda, you would say, why the tower? Well, there was one more tower, in there is one more tower in Stuttgart, it's the railway station tower. You see it right there, and you see the Mercedes-Benz symbol on top. This was a favorite with Hitler, uh, was built in the uh, late 30s, and I thought it was time that Stuttgart should have yet another tower, representing perhaps culture, and sort of the changing nature of culture. But as it turned out, the jury felt quite strongly that that was to remain the only tower appropriate. I 
I spoke about the materiality of architecture uh, and how it informs the process. To me, this has this, an additional dimension, which is sort of the compulsion to try and organize a building, the building system, into, uh, into a geometric order. Uh, and, and it seems to me that it is in building blocks, in toys that one sees, how uh, a, a set of geometry can be built into a toy, and then uh, a child with either more or less talent comes out with something pretty good. Uh, but as a concept, as an idea, this really goes back to vernacular buildings, where limited forms of construction are evolved over time into considerable perfection. And then these are manipulated as really building elements, building block. And so the dome and the vault in, say, brick architecture of the Mediterranean and, 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 uh, uh, and Persia uh, become a kind of a, uh, a recognition of how a process of building and sort of uh, more complex considerations of, of ritual and so on come together. And I'm, I'm particularly fascinated with those buildings which have been built perhaps with the least consideration uh, uh, for their, uh, say, ritual richness. Uh, this being a fertilizer factory, uh, or uh, to be more precise, a pigeon, uh, pigeon place. <laughs> and that is the interior. Uh, and it's, it's simply a logical way of building with my brick, a complex space which needed to f meet a particular rather simple program. And yet the manifestation of this, uh, of the building process in the architecture makes it as rich as any space we could conceive of. And I suppose here comes a moment where I cannot uh, uh, hide my own kind of uh, conviction that to me uh, a Gothic cathedral in which the richness of the spatial experience is totally integrated with its structural inventiveness and uh, the inventiveness of a building process is infinitely more uplifting than a, bar a Baroque church in which the experience is essentially achieved through painting and decoration which are completely detached from the process of building. And in a sense I'd say this is probably uh, what I would say today would be the difference between an authentic work and Disney. With Due apologies. Um, there is a question of whether this conviction has to do with pragmatism or with anything uh, or with any kind of ideology, because on the on the right is a chapel that was built in the uh, turn of the century uh, in wood, uh, put in boxes. Uh, when the building was demolished, I was given the task of rebuilding it in, inside the National Gallery, which I will show later. And I'll show it next to Canterbury, the real thing, and that's obviously not the real thing, and yet uh, it possesses the kind of richness uh, of spatial experience that is derived from this, the authentic. But where do you draw the line? Uh, in my own work, I, I find often that, the, that, it, that I cannot separate uh, the building process from the spatial and architectural expression. And going back to habitat, the building block as a mass-produced element, and I could not conceive of this building uh, built, say, in, 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 uh, in any other way. Or in Jerusalem, in the uh, Rabbinical College of Kovat Yosef, trying to deal with uh, a much more uh, specific context of the old city of Jerusalem, building in stone and concrete, uh, stone in the sort of traditional massive way, uh, lightweight uh, prefabricated structure within, a kind of a metaphor of the old and the new side by side, uh, and as one could see on the site, the masons putting it together like hundreds of years ago, the crane lifting the arches, and the both the massive and the lace-like uh, elements coexisting within the same building. Uh, the Ballet Opera House in Toronto uh, working on a load-bearing prefab precast concrete system to form the inner and outer spaces, uh, the towers containing the main uh, lobby or foyer, and these elements which have stone inlaid into them, but they are structural panels, coming together to form what I call the civic room, which is really the lobby when there's a performance, but a public room uh, which is, serves the city around the clock. 
Uh, again, the coexistence of very light glass and steel structure. This is a pyramid uh, and sphere working together structurally, which was developed together with the late Peter Rice of Obar, which was nicknamed the Spheramid, uh, <laughs> load-bearing or, or sitting upon these towers, which are load-bearing precast concrete. And that same vocabulary in different smaller scale form extended itself to the interior spaces in the Horseshoe Auditorium, you see a detail of its dome, and into the various public rooms and rehearsal rooms, the orchestra rehearsal room and the ballet rehearsal room, all sort of being extensions of this vocabulary. Moving, moving to the third theme of place uh, and fit into place, I think though there is somewhat of a, of a caricature in showing the Madaba plan of Jerusalem next to the uh, uh, conception of Le Corbusier for the contemporary city, it is nevertheless, I think, meaningful, to me at least, to consider the Madaba plan as a concept of public space. There is a city which is made up of a cardo, uh, a, a principal street, uh, monumentally designed as the spine of the city. All major public buildings then plug into it. And the rest is a sort of texture of houses and workshops and so on. So that it is the conception of the meeting place of the city that generates the city. And each individual building act then contributes to this conception. And for Le Corbusier, this is reversed because the horizontal fabric, the horizontal connector, which always created the meeting place in the city, disappears. In fact, Le Corbusier said that said, uh, the street is, is, I don't remember the exact word, but the street is, is, is terrible. We must do away with the street. Uh, and the notion is that one creates a new sense of freedom, a new sense of openness. Uh, and I think this must have been associated with notions that there is a kind of oppression to the political system that brought about this kind of city that one is free in uh, the Ville Ideas and uh, uh, Ville Contemporain. But uh, nevertheless, it seems to be central to each individual building act that it be considered as part of the common place and it be considered a contribution to the common place. And as far as I can see, all we've learned of the last 60, 70 years is that the horizontal connectivity, the place of meeting in the city as the spine of city life, is as relevant today as it was when uh, Byzantine Jerusalem was built in accordance with the Madaba plan. This, of course, being Rome on the left. And I'd like to just briefly show a number of projects in which I've tried to deal with a context, in most cases a rich context. Going back to Jerusalem, the Hebrew Union College set outside the city walls, but within the fabric of uh, buildings of the turn of the century, the whole notion of building with stone, which is, as I said, mandated by law, and actually expresses a notion of, of the desire of the society to create a harmony and continuity with the historic past. Uh, similar response in Warsaw after the war, when the downtown was rebuilt in, according, in accordance with what existed before the destruction of, of Warsaw during the Second World War. Very strong emotion about continuity. And that continuity has to do with building types. This is a courtyard from the Armenian Quarter in Jerusalem. And that campus is really a series of courtyards connected or carving through a fabric of building. Hostels, classrooms, library, uh, administration, museum, etc. All uh, sort of extending through a series of courtyards, integrating the notion of, of garden, of landscape and building. Obviously, in Mediterranean space, these courtyards really become the living rooms of this campus. And they are, in fact, where all the action takes place each classroom having an outdoor equivalent, uh, each cluster of classrooms opening up into a courtyard and the circulation being outdoors and connecting at many levels. And again, the coexistence of the traditional massive stone and the very light prefabricated concrete structure within. And moving uh, this designed almost at the same time, perhaps at the same time, the Quebec Museum of Civilization in Quebec City. 
dropping the temperature by at least 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, a Nordic city, a city of snow-shedding roofs, right by the river, which of course freezes a good part of the year. Uh, a museum of civilization for Quebec. Uh, so the story of the people of Quebec. Uh, and the scheme evolved as a sort of series of massive steps rising from the river and then becoming the building. You can climb up to the roof of the building. Uh, great effort to keep the building within the sort of uh, mass and scale of the surrounding structure of the, of the Place Royale. And this etching cropping up just as we finish the competition of the marketplace on the same location 100 years earlier with these grand steps going into the river, which of course got into the submission rapidly. <laughs> and there it is in the fabric of the Place Royale, a rather large building but broken up in a way, you can see it here from the upper city, uh, weaving in with the structures, copper roofs, which by now are turning green like this, uh, and the great park on the roof and the spar relating to the other spars of Quebec. And perhaps most central for me, the respect of the street edge, existing structure, new and old and new, and coming around the corner, carrying the corners, the, the street uh, edge, uh, around the building, and the skylights becoming the element that brings light to the museum and creates for this complex uh, <coughs> and the integration of some of the older buildings in the, in the, on the site into the museum. And a much more urban uh, problem in Montreal, uh, where there is a street, there's a museum, it is to be more than doubled in size. Uh, there's an existing museum, Sherbrooke Street, a beautiful 19th century street, mostly <laughs> helped out. Uh, as you can see, just fragments left of what was there at the turn of the century. But there, there is the uh, existing museum, as it was in 1912, and the fabric of Victorian houses and boutiques on the side streets. And then there was a question of this apartment building, which sat on the side of the museum. And I won't go through a long story, uh, other than to say that the museum thought the building should be removed, and the public consultation, very democratic process, uh, of public hearings, I say democratic process because you never know who voted for what and who came to vote decided that this was an architectural treasure. And so there it is being preserved at some cost. Uh, uh, the major gateway into the museum with a sort of courtyard that receives you from the street, relating back to the cornice, the existing building with galleries behind it, turning and transition to the scale of the surrounding streets. As we get larger in scale and we start creating fabric, uh, the, pro the problem becomes more complex. This is the Mamilla district on which I've been working uh, 25 years, um, beginning with a master plan for the area which used to be the no man's land and therefore really was partially uh, destroyed and partially vacant. And here one is into the making of fabric. Uh, the creation of a street system, uh, an infrastructure system, a decision on the scale of buildings and their relationship to the scale of what already exists in the city. Um, <coughs> the clues are really uh, to go back and recreate certain features of the site as they used to be in the past. This is the valley of Hinam, the historic valley, which is here restored back as a park, uh, having been filled with buildings. The old path from Jaffa to Jerusalem becoming a pedestrian street. Uh, the extension of the uh, housing fabric coming down the slopes into the valley. This is a hotel. The preservations of the building, uh, buildings built at the turn of the century. Uh, and here you see the components. These buildings being preserved, but opened up into a great pedestrian street with large structures across from the church and the monastery. Uh, here you see a major infrastructure uh, 
facility under construction, a thousand car garage, a bus terminal, uh, the street will continue on top. That is the way it will be when it's completed with a grove of olive trees and uh, parks <coughs> covering it entirely and creating this path which connects the old city with the new city. And this becomes the meeting place of Jerusalem across the valley which is now becoming park, uh, the village coming down the slopes. You see it under construction here with these uh, large domes, believe it or not, made in Holland, which form convertible spaces. They open up to become uh, terraces or greenhouses and a system of paths uh, which connect the housing with parking under. And finally, again expanding in scale, the new city of Modi'in, which is now under construction, just beginning construction, ex expected population of 240,000, halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, where the first recognition of the qualities of the site was these series of valleys which run through the site east-west, which become the lifeline, I call it the cardo of this, of this town. This is one of those valleys Buildings on the slope forming an edge that defines the valley, and the valley is 60% park, schools, shops, uh, community facilities, and where all the valleys meet is where the downtown converges. So here comes one valley, and a second valley, and a third valley, converging onto what will be the downtown, and this very large valley, the nature preserve, coming right into the city center. Uh, you can see here the connection between one of the valleys into the downtown, the crossroads of this road system, the uh, mass transit station, etc., etc. I should say that working on a city of that scale is absolutely frightening. Uh, you know that no major urban uh, undertaking of that scale in this century has succeeded, so you know that you will fail. You're not sure yet why you will fail. <laughs> Except that there are so many elements which cannot be controlled, so many forces. Uh, I could give one story uh, which fascinated me. For two years I had fought to get the wires in the city underground. You think it's sort of taken for granted. There was a substantial cost difference and the government refused, said wires above ground are good enough for us. And that's the way it was going to be until there was this terrible, unpredictable snowstorm uh, two years ago, in which all the power got knocked off by the trees that came down on the wires, and Jerusalem was out of power for 10 days, and then three days later came the decision, all the wires would be underground. <laughs> Though I have spoken of the, the context of a site and what it has meant in developing <coughs> these projects, I would like to, uh, to go beyond that to three uh, recent projects in which I felt the issue of context itself was not, was not enough. And I would, I would say that, I would summarize it somehow in the sense of the power to speak, that one becomes aware of the enormous power of architecture to say things. To, to, to speak of, of, you could say, of love, of hate, of fear, of disorientation, to speak of violence, or to speak of serenity. Uh, and that sense of the ability to transcend just what the program says and what a place says becomes a question of, uh, of, of the responsibility and the power to speak. And the first project is one which is very difficult to show is the children's memorial uh, uh, to, to the memorial to the children who died in the Holocaust in the Yad Vashem Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, when I was commissioned to do that, which was in 1976, I was asked to select the objects from the archive pertaining to children and display them in an appropriate manner. I worked on it for about two years, feeling discomfort with the mission, with the program. I felt that anyone coming to Yad Vashem, having seen the main museum, would not be able to absorb any more information, that they would be totally saturated. 
And so I came forward two years later with a counter-proposal. Uh, on a hill on the way out of the museum, uh, there was a natural cave. And I proposed that we descend through that natural cave into a large underground room. As we enter the room, there are a few photographs of faces uh, of children who had died in the Holocaust. And then as we turn, we enter a very large underground space in which there is a single candle which reflects into infinity in all directions. And we walk through, as we walk through the reflections of that candle, and emerge on the other side to the view of the mountains uh, of the hills of Judea. Uh, the single candle is reflected by a series of glass walls uh, and a bridge leads you through, so you're in fact totally suspended uh, in these candles. It took another five years before they built it. Uh, in, quite a different, in quite a different context, uh, totally different context, I would say that the uh, assignment to design the National Gallery of Canada had to do also with the sort of power, uh, the power to speak, or, the, or, or, or transcending the program. And perhaps the biggest decision, most important decision, was made by the government or those who were responsible in choosing the site, which chose a site immediately across from Parliament for the National Gallery and for the Museum of Civilization across the river. Uh, on the Quebec side of the, of the border. Uh, but the fact that that site was chosen still did not define what the formal relationship between Parliament and the National Gallery would be. And it was, in a sense, a feeling of opportunity that here a place of culture could coexist in dialogue with a place of governance that led me to place the uh, Great Hall, uh, the main space, of the museum right across from the Library of Parliament, creating a sort of L-shaped axis of entry, Great Hall, with a series of galleries, uh, and making that Great Hall an element, prominent element in the skyline. It was fascinating to see the cabinet, in discussing it, agreeing that it was appropriate for uh, a building of culture to take that significance between Parliament, the cathedral, and the National Gallery, here again, the Cathedral and the National Gallery. And it led to many other questions, questions of, can I have the other carousels, please? Questions of the sense of ceremony, uh, the, the symbolic and iconographic issues that a national building, a National Gallery, or any national building evokes uh, in people. And whether it is possible today to have an institution such as a National Gallery uh, be uh, open, accessible, inviting in a way that perhaps 19th century buildings were not. And perhaps further, is it possible to have a sense of ceremony and ritual without having a sense of uh, the pomposity of power? Can you be monumental and humane at the same time? And besides that, there was a whole question of syntax of neo-Gothic not even authentic Gothic, but neo-Gothic Ottawa, and the kind of uh, dialogue between the Great Hall and Parliament. And the sense of entry to the building, uh, ascending through the Great Ramp to the Great Hall. Uh, the Great Hall was conceived as a room of diverse activity, and it is fascinating to see how, in fact, that is become a reality with all the dinners of heads of state taking place, concerts, lectures, parties, etc. A room that transforms continuously uh, as it's sunny, the shades come out, uh, uh, as they want to have a concert uh, on a cold winter night, the acoustic banners are hung, and uh, so on and so forth. There are, of course, galleries in the building. <laughs> And I will not get into detail, but this, these are the galleries showing the lighting system that brings light from the roof down to lower levels as well as the upper levels. And galleries transformed to accommodate the particular collections, the Baroque collection, contemporary galleries, and the courtyards as places of rest, the oasis in the heart of the museum, sort of the inner sanctum 
of the of the museum as a place of total repose. And going down the other axis. And finally again in Vancouver, uh, the competition for the public library, uh, which to make things difficult was to include the federal office tower. First of all, the notion of library, the memory of all libraries, a place of the storage of culture. And there was this uh, nagging problem of how do you make a federal office building fit into all that without taking over. Uh, but I show you this one photograph of the model uh, as it sort of appeared in the referendum, because this design had to do with an architecture jury and a public referendum. Uh, luckily, the architecture jury and the architecture, the referendum agreed. I don't know what they would have done if there would have been different conclusions. But after we were selected uh, uh, in the process, uh, I was often asked, uh, the, the, pro the project was nicknamed very rapidly during the referendum, the Colosseum. Um, the other two projects had more difficult names. One was the parking garage, <laughs> and the other one was called the Pagoda. But so be it for uh, nicknames. But one of the things that seemed relevant to me was to outline the process through which schemes evolved to the scheme that eventually emerged. And we had uh, many models in the office of all the steps in the scheme. And at one point, my wife lined them all up and took a photograph. And here we have the city of libraries. Uh, I think Calvino would be proud. You walk down the streets, and there's one library after the other. This was one of the earliest schemes, placing the library with a sort of concourse street uh, with the office building at the other side. And the office building would have totally dominated. And here was the notion of put the stacks in the middle and take the reading room, which is usually in the middle of the library, and wrap it around. And so create a, a, a library where the reading room is the external element. Uh, but of course, you couldn't enter it from all directions, as I felt one should which led to the scheme that is now under construction, where the library forms a mass where the central block is the stacks and the work areas. The reading gallery wraps all around it, and you go over through bridges. There is a secondary wall that contains the office building and shops and daycare centers, which you see right there. And you enter this way, and this way, this way, and this way. And this is the concourse, a public room which is not ambiguously not part of the library, but part of the library, mm -hmm. where our shops, bookshops and record shops and cafes and so on, and then without sensing that you're going through a control point, you cross the bridge and you are in the library proper. You're coming down from the outside into that space and into the library proper. And in a sense, these two sketches are the sort of diagram of the building. You come into the concourse, and there it is, seven levels, the whole menu, all the departments, all there is to see in that building in terms of all there is to access in that building becoming understood in one glance. And then the sort of intimacy of the reading gallery, which is a place of community of readers on one hand, but it is also a place of much greater privacy than we have in the traditional great reading room, say, of the New York Public Library. And I suppose this whole notion came from a visit to New York where I came into the reading room, which is a beautiful uh, McKimmead and White building, beautiful room uh, filled with tables in the center, and seeing people sitting with laptop computers in that environment seemed, uh, seemed problematic. I think one would be more comfortable here with a computer looking back on the library with the books and looking out into the city which surrounds you. At one point, I thought we should send the design in without the office building and be heroes and say, federal office building doesn't belong in a civic library. Uh, since the federal government owned the land, <laughs> it didn't seem that would go too far. And then the slogan in the office was, if we find a way to make this building uh, uh, so much part of it that we would hate to lose it, we might have overcome it. And eventually, it was by subordinating the office building completely to the library, so that its presence is almost ambiguous as part of the library that we managed to overcome. This is 300,000 square feet of office space. 
Uh, these are very large mahabits. That's the mahabits downstairs. Um, and here you see the technology of the building evolving. Uh, the outer wall is made of enormously large precast concrete elements, which are actually made of reconstituting uh, uh, um, granite from the mountains around Vancouver, uh, sort of a reddish color, into which concrete is poured. So it's a poured in place building, but you never see the poured in place concrete because you only see the envelopes of precast concrete. It's also probably one of the first buildings in a long time to have the ceiling visible because all the mechanical systems and electromechanical distribution is in the subfloor, accessible from above, totally flexible, so the structure is raw and naked and visible from within. So, in conclusion, I would say my own agenda at this point, I feel, has to do with seeking the sense of repose and the garden as metaphor. Uh, these are the gardens in, uh, in the Baha'i gardens in Haifa, which is uh, the holy place for the Baha'i religion. And it always fascinated me that a religion identified so much with trying to recreate the Garden of Eden. And Eden really being uh, so much part of the uh, mythology in one form or another of almost every culture. But this sense of serenity also has to do with a reaction, a reaction to the excessive hubris that surrounds us, not both in the environment and perhaps even in some of the buildings which we build. I think the problem, the, the most complex problem, is one of, uh, one of size, one of scale. Um, and in these hanging gardens of different cultures, there was always a sense of trying to deal with what happens when we get high density. If I could have the lights back, please. The, it seems to me that what we need is a reaffirmation of the sense of what community is all about and the interpretation of urbanism, not as a kind of economic unit that works efficiently, but as a uh, social unit which works cohesively as a community. Uh, to me, it seems the real challenge at this point is, can we create a place, uh, a, pla a communal place, which, which is meaningful, but is the work of many minds? Not the work of a single architect, but that many architects can create a place, each making his own contribution, and at the end, we have a place which works as a whole, and a place which perhaps can deal with questions of access and pluralistic democracy. And it sort of brings me to a somewhat uh, fashionable uh, subject today, which I referred to earlier, which is the whole question of subversion. Subversion is when we try to act in a way that changes the prevailing order. And much of much is what, what is done in the avant-garde today in our profession is presented as a means of subversion, of trying to change the prevailing order which is deemed to be so unacceptable. And one cannot help but be sympathetic to the objective of questioning the prevailing order when there is within the prevailing order so much that dissatisfies us. But at the same time, I feel one must plead for reinstating the unique qualities of architecture, even when we consider subversion. Because subversion in architecture can only emerge when we subvert, we, when we subvert the program. When we are critical of the program and we find new ways of dealing with the program. Or when we subvert technologically, when we find new ways of building. Or when, when, when we invent new forms that are meaningful to the sense of community. We cannot subvert architecture by borrowing subversive tactics from other fields, from other arts, and assume that they are going to be meaningful in terms of the subversion in architecture. And so if we come back to the ethical question that I had introduced at the beginning, it all comes down, it seems to me, uh, to one simple question. Do we have compassion for those for whom we design? Thank you.
must see that architecture is still alive and well. I'm beginning to wonder if you read some of the recent articles in PA and some of the papers that have been circulating there. Lately, it's got to be something of a question of PAC. We're going to have a short period of uh, questions and answers and then turn it back to Andy for a presentation. Uh, we have questions. We would even accept a short statement from fans of Philip Johnson. <laughs> I wish more of that would happen, and I keep thinking about it myself and then getting frightened. Uh, but because of the complexity uh, and, 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 and scale of complexity of, of, of the real estate development world. But I think it, it, at a certain scale, this is happening and could happen more, and is really much easier than one thinks. And after all, most developers go into a situation and don't put one cent of their own money. So you would think that architects could go in and not put one cent of their own money. And then if it gets into trouble, it's the banks in either case. So, uh, <laughs> but I do feel that uh, having a much more active role, whatever it is, I don't know if it's a singular role or a more active role, uh, would change the results. And I think that actually the involvement of architects in the development process makes them in some way much more attentive to certain issues that they tend to sort of count on others to deal with uh, in, the, in the traditional process. The world being what it is, it's simply a question of timing. Uh, I mean, the media world, world being what it is, I, I, I feel that there is a kind of a, uh, amazing singularity to the sort of trends and attitudes, uh, no matter where you are today. What happens is that uh, in Israel, it just arrives three years later. Uh, you know, the magazines take longer to get there, uh, surface mail. Uh, but eventually, what happens is, is exactly the same. So if, if what has characterized the last 15, 20 years, at least in architectural education, that there are sort of waves of enormous impact on the students, which sort of possess them, which they become completely taken by, uh, and that you all, almost all of a sudden see enormous uh, uniformity uh, or similarity of response in the school a year or two, and then it changed, but again, enormous. I think that's true in Canada, I think it's true here, I think it's true in Singapore, and I think it's true in Israel, and it just happens a little later. Uh, I, I think that, that the emphasis in terms of uh, being able to uh, function as an architect might differ. Uh, that there's a much more uh, sort of down-to-earth attitude uh, where you sort of have to come out of school and immediately get absorbed by the, by the industry and function. Uh, I don't think that, that there is a sense of luxury uh, that uh, uh, students in the Ivy League school might feel about what, what they need to get by the time they leave the school in some other places. I became a com complete convert. I, I, I feel strongly, and I helped campaign for the superconductor, uh, superconductor continuing, not because it was a commission, but because I had spent a great deal of time. In fact, my involvement with the superconductor pr came after an interest in, in the field, visits to the uh, Fermi Lab, uh, which is the current largest conductor, uh, reading. Uh, intensively on where particle physics is uh, and realizing what the potential of the superconductor uh, was in terms of uh, resolving some of the unanswered questions of science. And I think it was a grave mistake to stop it. Uh, and I think uh, we will regret it, but come back and do it in, a, in maybe the next generation. I think that un until that happens, until something of that energy, that is the uh, and the energy of, uh, uh, of collision 
is created, some questions won't be answered. Now, I know that there's many people who feel that that money could be spent better in other areas of science, and you know, the debate could go on and on. But I became a total convert, no problem. Opportunity uh, with the Americans Architects and the National Housing Design Committee to spend an afternoon in the, with Jonas Sock in the courtyard. Uh, there's a lot of questions of morality from up. The courtyard apparently was not, and there was a great exciting thing for architects. So I would go unify. It never worked. Nobody ever penetrates the courtyard. The other, there's, other, there's another morality tension between the stars who sit in these things here with the laboratory workers who are equally qualified in many cases here. There's a morality issue there. And there's also that the, the, your courtyards and your courtyards were not the same. They were more rich and unified. I think. Uh, but it's interesting with Donald Winter and other people there, uh, Woodstock explaining the whole thing here, but it just didn't. It was the architect's concept or was it Sox concept, which never worked. The courtyard was not a unifying thing, but then segregated the scientists. Well, Sock has been taking so much credit for anything in the Sock Institute, and I'm sure he takes credit for that as well. So, <laughs> the uh, non unification of you. But, but uh, I, I know that that courtyard had gone through uh, many phases conceptually, that in the early sketches of Khan, it was a grove of trees filled with trees. And his notion was that uh, people would come uh, from the studies in the lab, and that would be where they gather. Uh, and then uh, uh, Luis Barragan was hired as the landscape consultant, and they met to talk about trees. And Barragan said, I know I'm the landscape architect, but there shouldn't be a single tree in the space. And Kant was quite moved by Barragan's conception of it. And I think it really made it into a monastic uh, very austere space, which it clearly is, which is, I suppose, why it excites architects and why some might feel that it's too austere to, to go into. But actually, I think that people do go into it. They go into it in a completely different way than they would have had it been a grove of trees. But to me, that's not a question of morality, because this is a question of interpretation. Kahn was really concerned about how scientists work. You might agree or not agree with this interpretation. Someone else would have had a different interpretation. But he, there's no doubt that he was concerned about the creative endeavor of working, of scientists working together. To me, the, the problem of morality is when one designs a place of research and one is not centered upon the question of what makes a place of research and what makes a place that gets people to interact in a, in a particular way that that contributes towards that process. Then, then the question is one of morality, because what right have we as architects to create our own agendas, which in any kind of detached way seem to be totally personal and lack any kind of uh, support uh, beyond our own uh, personal agenda? I think the question is just a, is the, is the segregation of the, of the laboratories and the, and the working people from either the association of the court that was a you know, direct cut, whether this, in your feeling, is a, is a moral. Now, I would do it differently, but I don't think that's a moral issue. I would just have done it differently. But, uh, but I don't think it's a moral issue because the concern was there. I'm concerned with the moral issue when the concern is not there. When you say team, there's, it, there's so many ways to interpret a team. When we talk about, I mean, for example, when they talk about a, a team designing a, a space shuttle, uh, the notion is that there's lots of people, each of whom have their own uh, creative role, and everything uh, sort of gets sorted out and, 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 and brought together. Uh, when we talk about a team that comprises an architect's office, we talk about a large group of people with different skills and different talents, each of whom makes his own contribution to a particular process. But 
I would, I would relate to team in somewhat a different way when we talk about the making of a part of the city by many architects. Because what you would have there is the uh, uh, collaboration of a number of individual strong-minded designers. And then the question is, can they agree on certain common denominators? Can they agree, first of all, on a framework that they all buy into? And beyond that, can they work in deference to each other and to that common denominator in a way that the pieces come together? Uh, and it seems to be possible. It seems to be possible. But it also seems to me that it, it requires somewhat of a different ego mindset to what the whole generation of architects are being educated to. Because I don't think it demeans your personal invention or creativity when you relate that to the work of a series of other individuals who e contribute equally uh, to what you're trying to do together. And the question is, can we get architects strong-willed, talented, very opinionated to get together and do something great as, as a team in that sense? I think one more question, way in the back. Just help me it'd be a bit more specific, like Well, you know, I feel completely different. I mean the library in Vancouver, uh, I think uh, I don't believe one should judge buildings that are not yet built in, in a sense of scale. Scale is the most fragile and difficult to predict. Uh, so I'd say, let's wait and see. I, there's, the concrete is up and I can guess at it, but I think it's premature. But I think the National Gallery, which is a very large museum, it's as large as the Metropolitan, is an example of a large building in which there is a hierarchy, a breaking down of spaces, so that no matter where you are, I think, I feel, that people feel comfortable. They're not overwhelmed. They're not overshadowed. Uh, and I think that's true of my work generally. At least my agenda is that I accept the fact that contemporary buildings, by nature, are much larger and more complex than anything we built 19th century and before. Whether it's a hospital, whether it's a 3 million square foot uh, uh, co co mixed use in the city, uh, whether it's a school, anything, that everything seems to be at much larger in scale. The question for me is, how do you break it down to a point where there is that sense of intimacy and the sense of comfort? Now, that does not mean that there have to be mean spaces or small spaces. Some of the most uplifting experiences I've had in, 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 in certain buildings uh, have been in spaces which are vast and generous. Uh, so being in the Great Hall in the National Gallery, it's a, it's a big room. It's uh, 10 stories high. Uh, but if I was to make an analogy, it's exceedingly more intimate and friendly and comfy, uh, I don't like the word, but let's, let's say comfy, than the rotunda of the National Gallery of Pope in, uh, Pope's National Gallery uh, in, in Washington, which is sort of a traditional uh, uh, domed, classical, massive space. Um, and it's, at least I can say my objective is to make spaces which, though generous and exuberant, are intimate and comfortable. Thank you, Russia. Now I'd like to turn the microphone back over to Andy, who will make a small presentation. Well, we uh, we want to show you our appreciation for, uh, for coming here, giving us this wonderful uh, lecture. This is...
design and, and crafted by one of our recent graduates, and I'm very proud to present this to you. Thank you.